Welcome to the Conscious Parenting Show. For those joining my show for the first time, I discuss many topics about parenting, but I also focus on self-awareness because we can only be a conscious parent when we are first a conscious self. I would like to quickly recap what conscious parenting means. This means we show up for ourselves and for our children in the best way possible, regardless of what is going on around us. To me, the best way possible means I can remain calm and I am focused and present in the moment without the distraction of my phone or TV. For more information and tips about conscious parenting, please visit my website at parentdoovers.com. You can also visit the North Shore TV YouTube channel. Today's show is about putting the needs of your family first, regardless of what the mainstream is doing. All too often we compare our children to their friends and sometimes we push them down a path that is not authentic to them just because everyone else is on that path. The thing to remember is that every child is unique and what is right for one child might not be okay for another. This even applies to siblings. Very often we look at other families and become judgmental in the way they are raising their children. But a conscious person observes the actions of others from a place of neutrality, unless, of course, personal safety is at stake. Today, my guest is Sandra Bossi. I met Sandra while working at HSS, Hospital for Special Surgery. I actually interviewed her to fill my role when I was moving to a new position in the organization. Sandra was the best hire and has since been promoted several times. She is now in her current role as senior director. I was always impressed with Sandra at work, but more so in the way she parented her son. Prior to working at HSS, Sandra worked on weekends. Her husband does most of his work in France and commutes back and forth as often as he can, but she is left to take care of her son on her own. They jointly decided to keep their son in school here in the United States. While many parents would hire a sitter for the home, Sandra felt her son thrived with outside stimulation from a young age. She also needed weekend coverage. A few years ago, Sandra told me that her son was going to China for a summer exchange program, and he was a little nervous because he had to present in Mandarin to complete the program. I remember wondering how he would manage a presentation in Mandarin. I knew he was also fluent in other languages because his extended family is from France and Serbia. I'm going to bring Sandra on because I love how she explains her parenting decisions. Hi, Sandra, thank you so much for joining. I know you're at a conference in Boston and I really appreciate you joining between sessions. I was just telling our audience how conscious parenting can be quite difficult when we're raising children and we have to make decisions for them with them at the center of what we do and how you had told me that your son was going to be in China doing an exchange program and had to speak Mandarin. And I was about to talk about it, but you tell the story so much better. So explain how this all happened. Sure, uh, and thank you, Andy, for having me today on your show. I'm a huge fan of your Parents Do Overs programs and really happy to share my experience here as a parent with your uh, viewers. So uh, uh, we as a family moved uh, to New York City from Paris, France, uh, when my son was five years old. And uh, my first job in New York City was at the MoMA Museum, uh, you know, where I was managing visitor services and working every Saturday and Sunday. So I was looking for a daycare uh, for my son, uh, which wasn't easy to uh, find on weekends. And so I came across uh, the New York Chinese School in Chinatown in Lower Manhattan on Mott Street, um, I, where uh, kids are, were enrolled all day long on Saturdays. And so what appealed to me was uh, both from a practical standpoint, I was looking for an inexpensive daycare, uh, but, and it was, um, but also something for my son to do that would be meaningful and beneficial to him. Um, and I thought that immersing him in a completely new culture from uh, both linguistic and cultural standpoint would be uh, tremendously beneficial. 
So uh, even though he was the only uh, child, kid in the class with no Chinese background, uh, because the school was uh, mostly Chinese uh, for Chinese expatriate families uh, who wanted their kids to learn the language both Mandarin and Cantonese and stay connected to the Chinese uh, tradition. Um, but for us, uh, you know, being uh, an immigrant family, my son already was exposed to you know, learning foreign languages. He was already fluent in uh, Serbian, in uh, French, and in uh, English, because I am originally from Serbia, and his father is from France. So uh, he already had that, uh, you know, multicultural background. And so uh, a lot of our friends were saying, oh, he, poor kid, he's going to be confused with all these languages. Uh, you know, he, he, he won't, uh, you know, he won't be able to distinguish. He may have some even de developmental problems later on by having so many things to uh, learn and handle. But, um, you know, I thought that this was a really good uh, solution for us at the time. And uh, and so he started going to that school and he w was the enrolled there all the way through his, mi uh, his uh, middle school. So um, I actually didn't realize the impact that that school had on him truly. Uh, you know, I had my perspective on it, but how he felt it, I didn't realize it until he uh, wrote his uh, personal essay um, as part of his college application. And his personal essay was on his experience in that Chinese school. And uh, so interestingly enough, I learned that that experience was not all that positive. It was not as amazing as I thought uh, it would be. And that actually uh, surprising to me, uh, like he even uh, dreaded those initial years there. He felt out of place, uh, you know, sometimes isolated. Um, and he even talked in his essay about the instance where uh, his Chinese teacher asked him to write uh, the character mom uh, on the board. And when he did, uh, all the kids uh, in the class started laughing. And uh, so his teacher told him, I told you to write mom and not horse. And uh, she asked him to return to his seat without showing him the proper way to write. And uh, apparently the word mom and the word horse are both spelled in Chinese uh, in the same way, ma. Uh, but there is a different tone, which results also in a different character. And obviously, my son picked the wrong one. So there was a frustration um, for him about not being a native speaker and, and not uh, filling in um, uh, as, as he would have liked. But um, it was uh, in later years when he started having uh, Chinese friends. And when he got actually a scholarship to go on an exchange program to Shanghai, uh, in his middle school that I think he started to see the benefits and to get the rewards of those experiences. And I remember we went to the Chinese consulate for him to get the visa for that exchange program. And he was there with other friends from uh, from his school. And uh, he was the only one, he was able to speak with the Chinese uh, officials in Chinese when he was applying for it. And then at the end, it turned out he got the visa for 10 years whereas his friends got for like, I think it was a shorter time, something six months or a year. And he was very proud of that. And he thought like, oh, <laughs> maybe because I, you know, I talked to them in Chinese. Um, and so um, I think traveling to China, he, you know, it allowed him to, you know, to get himself immersed in the culture and get a sense of belonging, which I think is really important, uh, you know, um, for those experiences. Also, later on, he had a Chinese uh, girlfriend, and I remember him saying that when, uh, you know, uh, his father would text her, he would be able to understand what he was saying, and sometimes when his girlfriend was busy, he was able to answer on her behalf and, uh, and respond back. So there were lots of other, uh, uh, unfortunately for him, moments where he uh, felt the benefits of, uh, of knowing the language of understanding the culture and of being able to travel and, and have that sense of belonging. And I think that more so than just learning a language, uh, you know, having that experience where you need to make an effort, uh, you know, because nothing is easy, nothing comes with uh, uh, without a price. And he was able to make that full circle and connect the dots. I think that's, that's probably the most uh, important part uh, of uh, that experience. Team learning Chinese. 
So Sandra, I have a question for you just about that. When he was little and he was going to this uh, Mandarin school, did he fight you in going or did he just compliantly go? He did not fight me. That's why I didn't know from the uh, really beginning that he had. It's it's really like it's so in impressive when years later you learn about something that you totally missed and you didn't notice. You know, we 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 would go there before we would have a tea or stop and have a, a dessert in a Chinese bakery before we would go. We would sometimes get some toys and play as we were going there. So I have seen one part of that experience, but I, I didn't obviously know what inside was going in school. He did, he would bring in the books. We would talk a little bit, but like what he really felt and how he felt like that incident where he didn't know how to, where, where he uh, didn't uh, wrote the character of mom correctly. Uh, he never shared that with me before. That's so interesting. Um, I also find it like um, fascinating that he went to the school, didn't know the language, and kids are so much more resilient than we are, and they just sit there and they absorb until they figure it out. You know, that he was there, he didn't know the language. And I think you had mentioned that you had taken him to school one day only to find out that the school was closed. So tell us about that. So uh, all the communication with that Chinese schools for many years, it was just simply in Chinese. And uh, since uh, we didn't speak, nobody in the family spoke, and Elliot, Elliot's Chinese back then was not good enough for uh, him to read the administrative instruction papers, etc. So uh, they had their own holidays, and the school was closed on a certain Saturday, when which we didn't know. We went there, and it was closed. And I was really, uh, I, I was unpleasantly surprised because I had to go and work, and uh, and he couldn't go to school. <laughs> So uh, I remember the the guardian. There was a guard at the door, um, the, the guard at the school, and he told us, "But it's closed." And uh, that's when we learned. Right. That's so interesting. Um, I love how he. You know, hindsight is so amazing when we're parents. You know that when we look back, um, if only we could look in a crystal ball and look ahead. <laughs> but um, you know that. Um, I do find it's the path less traveled, the harder paths that really define our kids, more so than the paths that are so easy for them. So I think mm -hmm. it's just amazing that, you know, it, something about his temperament that he didn't just outwardly kind of, you know, tell you he's not going, and somehow he just knew that he, this is something he needed to do. Um, and he needed to go, you know, so. And when he moved to the States at five, did he speak English? He did. Uh, he was not, he didn't have a native fluency. He had native fluency in Serbian and French, but he was already, um, uh, he had a good grasp of English because uh, knowing that we would come here, I was, uh, I was preparing him for that in France. Yeah. Um, I also know that, um, because of your circumstance with your husband working in Europe a lot of the time, you had to do things a little bit different than other parents. And so Elliot became very independent very early. And so tell us about you know that and what other parents would say to you. Right. So, uh, you know, in uh, in the New York City, like I haven't relied so much on uh, baby uh, sitters. Um, I think already, like as a as you know, as an immigrant family in New York City, you know, you you um, there was not necessarily a roadmap already traced, as you said. Like, you know, you need to adjust to the things as you go along and adapt to things that work for you. So, uh, uh, we we've been doing things that are not standard, and that has always been kind of our standard. So the same way for Elliot, um, you know, uh, not having the babysitter, um, you know, he was, uh, he learned very quickly and was able to stay at home alone, uh, you know, when I would work long hours. And then also by age 10, you know, he knew how to use the subway system and go places on, on, on his own, because he was doing lots of activities, singing in a choir, playing soccer on Randall Islands, and, and, um, and, and, and needed to be able to, to get there by himself. So, um, 
uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I remember when he was playing soccer, uh, there was a bus that would take the kids to, to the Randalls Island, but he was sick on uh, in the car or on the bus, and he preferred to go there on his own. So obviously for me, the first time he took the subway on his own, I was very worried, uh, you know, there were and nervous and uh, there have been some mishaps once he would, you know, lose a subway card. Even sometimes he left uh, a phone in the subway and, and the person who found the phone called me and found my number, called me and that's how we recoup the, the number. So there were some mishaps as he was doing it. But uh, very early he was able to, uh, to learn all of these things that usually kids learn, learn later. So um, I could feel, um, you know, that my, uh, you know, by by interacting with other parents uh, at Elliot's age, uh, who had kids Elliot's age, um, that sometimes, you know, my sense of responsibility as a parent was questioned because of, of the way how we did things. Um, and obviously, uh, I would have liked to have an ability to drive him around, drop him where he needed to go, but it just uh, wasn't uh, possible. And so, therefore, you know, we I really had to give him the tools and teach him how to be self-reliant very quickly and learn those things quickly, even though, as I said, there were, you know, there were accidents, there were mishaps, et cetera. But what was, um, you know, what was uh, um, really uh, uh, an interesting, uh, in, uh, you know, anecdote is that one of those parents who, who uh, once to told me, like, that she would not uh, allow her son to go there alone, just a year later uh, called me and asked me if Elliot could take her uh, son to, to the, you know, to the, to the soccer practice and bring him back home uh, after that. And so he has done that multiple times with his, uh, uh, with, with, um, with his friends, uh, and I think, uh, you know, um, teaching them how to use the subway cards and circulate in New York City subway. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I grew up in South Africa where we were much more independent at a much younger age because mm -hmm. you could walk places. I remember at the age of like nine, walking to the bus paying my few pennies, getting on the bus, and going to the beach by myself. We all did it. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's interesting because I just did another show about society norms and how, mm -hmm. you know, people judge based on society norms. And I know you also had told me a story where somebody tried to make you feel lesser than as a mom um, in a park when Elliot was little. So tell us about that one. Oh, that, that was in Paris. He was really, he was a toddler. And, you know, in Paris, you have those beautiful parks with fountains where kids can play in the sand, uh, you know, in the water, etc. And so Elliot was very little and at that age, they also still put a lot of things in their mouth. And so he was kind of experiencing it all, like trying to drink water from those fountains, like playing in the dirt and, uh, you know, um, and, and, uh, and, and climbing the, 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 the steps, etc. And so there was a woman next to me and she started asking me questions if this was my son and then uh, you know, uh, you know, gently suggesting that he should not maybe be doing all of these things, that it's dangerous, that's not good for his health, et cetera. And so I started doubting. I was like, oh my God, like I'm really letting him do all of this. Is he going to get sick, et cetera? And so I tried to tell him, hey, don't, don't put that in your mouth. Don't do this. Don't. And I all of a sudden saw in his face, like the change of expression from like that happiness of, you know, discovery to not being happy of being so constrained or not doing this. And so then I asked the, we continue talking and I asked the, the, the woman who approached me like, you know, how old were her kids? And she said, like, I don't have kids. And that really stuck with me because as parents, particularly when you have, uh, you know, your first child, and, and and I only have one son, you uh, you really at the beginning you are not sure about the ways how you do. You take a lot of advice, you read, you want to know, and um, that was some like a revelation moment for me where I just thought like maybe I should. Uh, start learning from what my son has to tell me and learning from him and learning from our relationship more so than uh, just taking advice here and there and everywhere, particularly when it also comes from someone who may, you know, have never had, not, not, that, not that I, not that she wouldn't have a, a good uh, thoughts, but it just like puts you in perspective that 
uh, you know, m maybe your child is the right person to learn from. And that, that was very important for me going forward. And I, I try to to use and uh, have that approach the, as, as much as I, as I could. Wow, you couldn't have said it better because a crux of conscious parenting is how we need to learn from our children and how our children teach us the most about ourselves. That when our children set us off and we feel triggered, why is that? And rather than you know, diminishing our children or disciplining our children to take that moment and go inward and say, what is my child trying to tell me? And you really mm -hmm. wrapped up the show talking about how each child is so unique, each family structure is so unique. And wouldn't it have been nice in any of these situations if these moms could have just been more supportive and less judgmental, maybe even asking you, do you need help? Like, do you need your son to meet along the way? Um, you probably, he probably would not have, but it, you know, I know your son and he is, he's always thrived. He's always been a self motivator. I think you've been incredible role models in showing him that you're both working hard. You're doing what you need to do. His father works in a, another entire country and you make it work as a couple as well as his parents. And I just think, you know, he, this is just such validation how, you know, he has really thrived. And he went to an incredible high school, you know, so he's had many changes in his life. And I am so happy you're on our show as our guest today. This was really fantastic. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Andy. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation. And thank you for doing Parents Do Overs. That was a great example of conscious parenting and following the path that is right for your child and your family. I was always impressed with Sandra whenever we discussed parenting. She was doing the best she could with her son, who was always the center of her decisions. Both parents are excellent role models, and it was instilled in their son that he was trusted and capable of succeeding, which he did in all areas. Sandra's son also paved the way by getting all information that he needed and completing his own college applications. Not only is Sandra's son thriving at a top tier school, but what impresses me is his self-motivation, his perseverance, and his resiliency, which I do believe was formed in the early years when he was put into new situations. We know that all children are different, and it's important to trust your own instinct when it comes to parenting your unique child. Thank you for tuning in. Again, you can always connect with me at parentdoovers.com, and make sure to check out the North Shore TV YouTube channel for more conscious parenting shows if you enjoyed this one. I will see you next month.